This is Christmas. Christmas according to the Bible, not according to tradition or culture. Christmas according to the Bible. Now, some of you, I have pastored for a number of years, and you might have heard me say some of this stuff before, because Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 21, is Christmas according to the Bible. This is what Christmas, the very first Christmas, was actually like. And it's not quite what you think. It's not what you think. It's different. And, um, you know, you heard this passage, we sing the songs, and then you have like this manger scene in your mind, and uh, it's half wrong, <laughs> right? Um, this is what's in the Bible, and I want to get at that today. And it really has a lot to say about poverty. I want us to talk about poverty. And I want us to talk about poverty, actually the much worse poverty. I'm not talking about poverty with money. Last week I ended my sermon with a reflection about a much worse poverty than the poverty of money. I'm talking about the poverty inside. And I want to talk about that today. Because this first Christmas is about an event where there was so much poverty. But actually that is the way God looks at human beings. He sees this poverty and we can read the story and you can see all this poorness, this lowliness. But really, God is telling us the reason the day He's going to be born on the earth is going to be like this is because that's the way it needs to be if He's going to be with us. If He's going to be Emmanuel, He has to come into great poverty. Okay? Part one, Emmanuel with poverty. Emmanuel means God with us. If God's going to be with us, that means he's going to be with poverty, okay? Emmanuel with poverty. Part two, external riches, yet inner slums, okay? External riches, yet inner slums. And part three, from humiliation to exaltation. That's the way the greatest theologians describe what Jesus did for us. From humiliation to exaltation. Okay? Part one. Let's, uh, let's get into the text. And um, I want to just show you a few things. The Bible, it's only 21 verses. And, but you know, you're taken into a world. You're taken into a time. And the words are so economical. And they say things like this. They have to go to this place. You have to go to this city. And who decided that Joseph and Mary have to travel in the third trimester? You know, um, moms, dads, you know, do you want to go someplace on the third trimester? Isn't that what the doctors say? That's not, you don't travel that day. So, you know, Mary goes, let's, we got to go over there. Who, why are they going there? Because a very, very insensitive government, an oppressive government called the Romans say, we're going to count you. And wherever your family roots are from, that's where you got to go. <laughs> so, that means third trimester, you're going to travel. So just think about that first. It's such a great story, isn't it? It's such a great story. Christmas, it's so beautiful. And we're going to have this great manger scene. But if you really just, the very first verses tell you it's terrible. It's terrible. Um, Mary's big. And she's sitting, maybe, maybe she's sitting on a donkey. If they have enough money for the donkey. And Joseph, of course, you know, he's going to be a good, you know, they're, they're engaged. So they're not even really quite husband and wife. And he's going to leave the donkey. And it's third trimester. And what do you think they're praying? 
don't let us go into labor, please. Don't you know that's what they're praying? It's already a hard story, okay? It tells you things like this. It says, Mary his betrothed, not his wife, his betrothed. And this is a very conservative culture. If you show up at a Christmas party and you show up with your girlfriend in a very traditional conservative culture and she looks like this, is that a happy event? Is she very welcome? If you're Joseph, are you welcome to your family? We're talking about your family. You go to a Christmas party. Your whole family's there. That's, that's something that's going to happen this Friday. I'm going to go to my extended family Christmas party on Christmas Eve. I won't go into details, but there's some drama inside of our family. And I got a call finding out that certain people aren't going to show up just because there's some deep-seated problems, okay? And that's a normal family, but we got this girl chosen by God. But how many people you think in her family think she's chosen by God? And they're poor. They're low. And they're going to go into their family. And she's not wife. She's betrothed. And she looks like this. Okay? So, now you're going to go to a city you don't want to go. You don't have much money. Your family is not happy to see you, and they're all there. <laughs> Everybody, your cousins, your second cousins, your aunts, your uncles, the cousins of your aunts and uncles, they are all there in this town, and they are all paying the money for every motel, hotel, every Airbnb, if there was such a thing, in Bethlehem, your family, your family's families, they're paying all the money for everything, all the rooms in that town. So what you think about this? So there's this little phrase, And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger, laid him in an animal feeding trough. In a simple little phrase, because there was no place for them in the inn. Is it because they couldn't afford it? Is it because in the inn, they would say, what's your name? And then they would say, well, that's your wife, right? Uh, not, actually, no. But look at her. And is it because then they were like saying, well, then get out. Because we don't want people like you here. Maybe it, that was the reason they were in the stable. Maybe it's because you know, all the prices are up because there's a lot of people from outside of town in town. And so, you know, demand is high, supply is low, prices go up. Maybe that's the reason. Maybe both of those are the reason. But I th often think about this other one. All your cousins are in town. All your aunts and uncles are in town. Don't you have one rich uncle who will say, well, you're third, third trimester, right? I'll pay for that room. Don't you have one cousin in town who will say, you can share our room. It was expensive. We had to pay too much money for this stupid room. It wasn't even a nice room. It wasn't a Holiday Inn. It wasn't even Motel 6. It's like, Lower than Motel 6, but it costs twice as much. But you know what? You're our cousin. So your family, and I don't care what everybody else says in our family about you, 
Mary, you're not, you don't even belong with us yet. But even though everybody says, you're some kind of tramp, you can have our room. Because that's, you're pregnant, girl. Shouldn't that have happened? Shouldn't that have happened? Just think about this. This is, it should have happened. Right? But it didn't. It didn't. So, there's this detail. They wrapped them in swaddling cloths and laid them in a manger. Everybody knows that detail. Famous song. Away in a manger, no crib for a bed. Everybody knows that. You know why you know that? The Bible doesn't tell you one time. The Bible doesn't tell you twice. That you know in less than 20 verses, it's said three times. It's said three times. I'll, I'll tell you. Verse 7. She gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger. All right. Verse 11. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. Think about that. You're out in the field. You're working. You are at the bottom rung of society. You're a shepherd. You are in the working class. You are in the working part of the working class. You are in the working class part that the other people who work think that you're the bottom of the bottom. Because the sheep are the stupidest animals and nobody likes them. And you get to do that job because you're at the bottom. And then the angel tells you, this is what you will find. You will find this. There's going to be a baby in a feeding trough. It's not that hard to see. You're like, what? 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 Say that again? <laughs> what? It's not something you see every day. And the reason you don't see that every day is because it's never supposed to happen. It's not supposed to happen. Go over to this town over there. Go where the animals are. And you will find a baby. And he will be in a manger. So, you know, that's weird. Um, I don't know. I think about what's, what's, what's the equivalent. Go to a poor town. Go to the poor side of town. And um, find a doghouse. And find the place where they put the food where the dog eats. And there you'll see the baby. That's the announcement. That's the second time it's said. Verse 16. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. That's how we all know. The Bible is saying don't miss this. Don't miss this. And one of the things I really want to say today is don't let 2,000 years of tradition and culture. You know, the first Christians, when they first believed in Jesus, they knew they were believing a crazy story. They knew that Christmas was a terrible story. On one hand, it's a terrible story. And a lot of the people who first became Christians in the Roman Empire, they were poor. They were despised. They were low in society. So when it came to Christmas, when they heard the message, you know what they said? That's our story. 
So then Constantine comes along. He's at the top of the food chain in the Roman Empire. He becomes a Christian. And the whole Roman Empire starts to celebrate the story. And then we start getting Christmas traditions. And we start having Christmas songs. And we start having lights. And it starts getting beautiful. And the whole culture, middle class people, upper class people, we start having, it becomes a beautiful time for Christmas. But I want you to know, for several hundred years, it wasn't like that. And at the beginning, it wasn't like that. At the first Christmas, it is not for middle class people. It is not for upper class people. It is not for the respectable people. They all could have come. They all could have said, come to my hotel room. You're my family. You're my cousin. You should be in my hotel room. I have enough money to buy a Motel 6, even though it costs too much money. And you can be in my room. And they were not there. And Christmas was for the dirt poor. (laughs) Okay? This is really for Christmas. And so when the Son of God, when God Himself, when the Most Majesty and on high came, He came like this. That's Christmas. Okay? Let's go to part two. External riches, yet inner slums. This is the way I closed my message last Sunday in part three. I I, I said this. You and I have no business being loved, embraced, and accepted by God. In His presence, money, degrees, nice clothes, Upper class manners mean nothing. Nothing. They are worthless. Yet that's what we care about all the time. That's what we spend most of our waking hours. We work many hours to get these things. We study long hours to get these things. My daughter's currently in 11th grade. And um, when I was in 11th grade, I slept four hours a night and then another 30 minutes in history class, <laughs> okay? And then maybe another 20 minutes after I got home because I wanted a degree and money and nice clothes and upper-class respectability and a good life, okay? And I watched my daughter get four hours of sleep or five hours of sleep because tomorrow is AP U.S. History exam. (laughs) In AP U.S. History, I never took it, thankfully. Some of you did. I'm sorry. (laughs) I'm sorry you took that class. If you remember something from class, good for you. But if you got an A in AP U.S. History, You got a five on that AP exam. And that helped you get into, name the school. And that helped you get that great major and that great degree. And when you get before God, it will be worthless. (laughs) Worthless. And yet, that's what we are all about. Especially this city. You, you guys know that's true. We all know it's true. And it's not just a city. It's life. It's life. That's how life is. So, we have this stuff. If you get the five, if you get the degree, if you get the money, if you get the promotion, if you get the house, and people look at you and you're like, that is a good person. That's, a, that's, that's an admirable person. And on this earth, for 70 years, or 80 years, or 100 years. And that's only if you keep the respectability. And that's only if your industry doesn't go in the tank. 
And that's only if maybe, you know, you don't get divorced at the t- at the, in your late 40s and your kids stop talking to you. Then you can enjoy all this external riches and respectability for a hundred years. That's the best case scenario. That's the top of the mountain in this earth. Yes? I mean, maybe, you know, you're like, okay, if I become super famous, if I become Steph Curry or in my then, okay, maybe, okay just for regular people, we don't, we don't think like that. External riches. But when God looks at you, He's not looking for those things. Let me ask. Humility, righteousness, grace, forgiveness, mercy, justice, generosity, love. These are the things that are infinitely of great worth. That is what makes us really, really rich. That's true riches. That no no money, no bank account, no bad economy, nobody can take. If you have this inside of you, you have real riches. And when we stand before God, He's not going to look at your bank account. He's going to look inside. And you know that we are, when we look inside, If you are honest, it doesn't matter how much money you have on the outside. It doesn't matter what achievements or what nice clothes you have on the outside. On the inside, if you're really, really honest, there's some goodness, but not much. And there's some mercy, but not much. I'm a forgiving person, except for you know who, who really stabbed me in the back. And when I think of them, they might as well be dead. I'm never going to talk to them. I can't ever come around. Even if it's family Christmas. (laughs) Screw that. That's what it's like inside. If the Lord is to come into your life, he's not just coming into your house or your neighborhood. Neighborhood, He's going to come into your heart. He has to come into the neighborhood of your soul. And let me ask you this question. What is the neighborhood of your soul like? And if you're really honest, isn't it a slum? Isn't it a slum where all the real riches are missing or really, really low? Isn't there some nasty, gross stuff inside this neighborhood? Where Jesus was born, there was the lowest class, no relatives. How about this one? No doctor, no nurse, no midwife. But there were animals, and it smelled bad. That's where Jesus was born. And if Jesus comes into the neighborhood of your soul, aren't there things that smell bad? Aren't there things that are really embarrassing? Your pride, your hatreds, your resentment your greed, your lust, your envy, your covetousness, your very high self-regard, except when you have your low self-regard. Your very high self-regard, except when you hate yourself. The ways you ignore the weak and avoid them. You know, most of us, out of 365 days a year, we're glad to avoid the poor. And then, For maybe a couple hours, a couple days a year, we'll volunteer for the poor. That's normal. And then there's other things. There's our denial, our callousness. And then the way we tell ourselves that we're good people, 
according to a very low standard. So that's the only way we can see. Like, we cannot look at all that really bad stuff inside. You look into your own neighborhood of your own soul. It's so bad. But then, we go, okay, okay, what's good inside of me? And then we tell us we're good because we make the standard low. We drop the standard. I have good intentions. I'm not mean to the poor people. I don't give anything to poor people, but I have good intentions. That's a pretty low standard. I'm not racist. I'm not racist. But if they tend to be of a different skin color and of a different ethnicity, it's not like we're that comfortable being with them, eating with them, being friends with them. I'm no worse than anyone else. I'm not worse than anybody else. But think about this. If the standard is not worse than the average, but everybody's average is a slum, it's not a great standard, is it? Okay, that was hard, huh? I just want to try to help you to see. I'm trying to break through something. We live in delusion most of the time. Most of the time we just let everybody else tell us who we are. And then what everybody else tells who we are is how we tell ourselves. In other words, we tell our it's identity from culture. It's my self-assessment from culture. Not who I am from God, from the Bible. And so then, you know, we're all, we just rather, everybody else is doing it, so that's just us doing it. And then we spend all our time building our life for external riches while inside we're living a terrible slum, horrible slum. But here's what Christmas is for, okay? Why don't we let so many people in? So this is part three, by the way, okay? From humiliation to exaltation. Why do we have these high walls of privacy? Why don't we let a lot of people into our lives? I mean, like, really in. Because the slums are embarrassing. They're humiliating. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm watching, like, movies and dramas today that are really interesting. A lot of the movies and dramas today, basically, it's not even like believing in God. It's like believing in love, okay? Believing in love. Believing somebody will love you and be with you and want to be with you and marry you. You know? Um, <laughs> Okay, this might be kind of embarrassing. My wife and I just finished this Korean drama called Coffee Prince. It's from 2007, right? And there's a couple in there. They've been dating for like 10 years. Okay, they dated. Then she cheated on him. Then they broke up. Then he got back together with her. And then she wanted to dump him because he fell in love with somebody else. And then they finally want to get married. 10 years. And it's like, yay! <laughs> and then you know what he says to her? Thank you for wanting to love me. It's like this incredible journey that it was such a difficult thing that somebody would love you. That's kind of the story of today. A lot of young people today, they don't even think they're going to get married. Or they're not even sure. That's not a goal. That's not in their plan. Or it's a dream. And that makes me, man, that makes me sad. There's a movie that came out a number of years ago where the woman, she's the main, you know, heroine in the romantic comedy. She says to the guy, and you know that they're going to end up together at the end of the movie. She says to him, you're a romance atheist. You're a romantic atheist. That's why she can't be with him. And you know why we are like this? I'm not even talking about God. 
You just don't even want anybody else to get into the neighborhood because if they actually marry you and spend time with you, they'll be into the neighborhood and you will find out in the neighborhood it's a slum. And they're like, whoa, this is gross. There's some really smelly, disgusting things in the neighborhood of your soul. And so, after, will you clean that up? Clean it up. And then, you go, okay, okay, well, I haven't been able to clean it up for 25 years or 30 years or 40 years. So, okay, I, you want me to clean it up, so I, I better try. Then you try. You, you like, try to be a better person. Try to be more like, you know, understanding wife or husband. And then it still stinks. And then your spouse gets really mad. Then you have that fight. And this time, the fight is not denial fight. It's just, can't you understand? Because I've been in your neighborhood, and it's gross in there too. (laughs) Why don't you fix this? It's gross. It's poor. It's awful. And I'm married to you. (laughs) So you know what's happening? You got this man, and his wife knows him. He's so humiliated. And you have this this woman... And before her husband, she's humiliated. And after you go through the round and round of the fights, you have this fight for the 10th time or the 20th time, and you've been humiliated 20 times. And you start having this fantasy, a little fantasy that they'll, you know, they'll be, there's somebody better out there. <laughs> there'll be somebody better out there, and when they come into here, They'll be okay. They will understand. (laughs) And I will not be humiliated. That's poverty. (laughs) Because we can't fix the poverty and we get humiliated inside of it and then we don't want to let anybody else into it so now we're lonely. This wasn't, I wasn't planning to say this, but I'm just going to just say this. This is just a bonus, okay? When you drive around, or if you walk on the street, and you see that dude who's got that um, beggar sign, or you see the old lady pushing the cart, you know, because she's, you know, we have this term, bag lady, Okay? Those people are so lonely. They have nobody will come into their the neighbor the slum of their neighborhood. And they themselves have given up that anybody else would come into the slum of the neighborhood of their soul. So now they don't try to get a job. They beg. Or the bag lady, she doesn't even beg. She just looks for cans. Okay? And I want you to understand, you and I, don't look at them and go, why don't you get a job, man? If you just see that external poverty inside, it's a thousand times worse. It's a lot worse. And inside, it's pretty much the same as you and me. It's pretty much the same. And when we go before God, He sees all of it. I got to tell you something good. Let's close. Jesus came to enter into the poverty, into the slum. He came to be with us in our worst inner slum. That's why the first Christmas has such great poverty. It's a picture of the bigger truth of the world and of your and my inner slum. But the best theologians teach that the incarnation of Christ is a movement from humiliation, which we all have, which we all feel, and which we all hate. It's a movement from humiliation to exaltation. 
We are in our slums every day. And no money or riches, external riches, can clean it up. Not your efforts, not your discipline, not your righteousness, not some self-help book or self-help class, or how many times your wife, your husband, you name it, yells at you. Your mom, your dad, your professor, whoever, your boss yells at you. You can't fix that slum. But God came to enter into the humiliation. He came to be with us in our humiliation. That's what Emmanuel is. God with us in the humiliation. God with us in the inner slums of our hearts and the true desperate poverty of our souls. He did not do this so that we'd be stuck there. But he came so that the neighborhood of your soul could become something beautiful. He came to exalt the human heart. Emmanuel so that you can share in his journey from humiliation to exaltation. He lowered himself to become human so that the humiliating slums of our broken down, sin-filled humanity could be borne up by him. It could be atoned for by him. He could be, we could be loved by him and embraced by him so that he could conquer all this slum infested, dying, dying, dying humanity with his dying. And then, through his death and resurrection, in the fullness of his humanity, he could give us a divine humanity, a conquering humanity, a beautiful humanity, so that in our soul, there will be no more slum, and he would make it a house, a castle, a glorious neighborhood where he would dwell and make us like him. That's Christmas. Could you believe in that? When you look at Luke chapter 2, could you believe in that? So, here's the verse I haven't said to you yet. When I see, read this verse, I cannot help but think about Luke chapter 2. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. Merry Christmas, church family. I love you. Let's pray. No no matter how rich or respectable how much praise lavished upon us by others. There is no hiding from ourselves. <laughs> Actually, we try to hide from ourselves. We have a, even have a word from it for it, Lord. It's called denial. It's called avoidance. And one day we will come and stand before you. You are truth itself. You are glory itself. And inside of you is every riches and every wonder. And what the Bible says on that day, if we show up in ourselves, we will die. We'll probably die of shame and humiliation. But you came into the most lowest and terrible poverty to say that you will come into the neighborhood of this soul. The poorest places on earth aren't places like Bethlehem or the worst slums of the worst cities. The poorest places on earth are inside of us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you came to be one of us so that you can come into the slums of our hearts so that by your poverty 
we might become rich. Thank you that this is the good news. And the gospel starts here. Thank you that this is the pathway to true and eternal life and everlasting riches. And it's ours by grace if we would but only believe and ask you in. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.